So this is the second part of the mechanistic niche modeling um, lecture uh, for the ecological niche modeling course for 2020. So in the first lecture, I gave an outline of the concept of a mechanistic niche model. Um, and in this lecture, what I'm going to do, or this part of this lecture, is, is talk about heat budgets and microclimates. So as I mentioned, um, we're thinking about these three broad topics, biophysical ecology, microclimate modeling, and energy budget modeling. And so the heat um, the heat budget side of things. Um, we're not going to talk much about. I'm not going to talk much about water in this, um, but but also the water side of things relates to biophysical ecology. And uh, in our thermodynamic scheme that I introduced in the first part of this um, lecture series, we're talking about the the heat budget. This area, um, this grey area here, where we have a whole series of terms that relate to exchange of energy in the form of heat that according to the first law of thermodynamics must sum to zero when you add them all together, put them all on one side. So I'm going to give you an idea about how it actually works to solve a heat budget for an organism. Um, and I'm going to give you a very simple uh, example to give you the gist. So here we have our um, desert scene uh, out in Kalgoorlie in Western Australia on the right with grey skink sitting there under the bush. Uh, here's a schematic of that. And um, but down at the bottom here, we have the, the, the energy budget, the heat energy budget. In simplest form, it equals energy in, it is energy in is equal to energy out. But we can break the energy in and the energy out terms into a series of terms that relate to the particular processes of relevance to a lizard on the surface of a, in a terrestrial environment. And so um, in terms of the gains of heat, always there's some metabolic heat being produced by an organism. Uh, just in the case of an ectothermic animal, it's usually very, very minimal, but it's still there. Um, when the sun's out, there'll be solar radiation being gained by the organism as well. And there's always infrared radiation being gained from the organism as well. Every single surface around you right now is emanating infrared radiation and your body is, infra is, is also uh, emanating infrared radiation. So, um, energy is coming into this animal by that process, but it's also being lost by that process of infrared exchange. Actually, this is one of the most dominating influences of heat exchange that we don't tend to think about. Um, then there's convection, and that is, is being driven by the air temperature and wind speed. And I've got it in blue and red here um, because it may be a gain in heat or a loss in heat, depending on whether the animal's cooler or warmer than the air. And the same with conduction, uh, it may be gaining heat from the substrate or it might be losing heat to the substrate depending on the temperature difference between the organism and the substrate. And then um, evaporation, that's a process that is usually a loss of heat um, through breathing, through loss through the skin. But uh, it may also be a gain if water is condensing on the surface of the organism. So there's the basics of the heat budget of a lizard, but we can really simplify this down. Um, as I mentioned, metabolism is a very minor heat producing term in uh, an animal like a lizard. And in fact, every the, the, the breathing rate is directly proportional to the metabolic rate and water is being lost through the breathing. And in most cases in small organisms, the amount of heat that's being produced by the metabolism is actually roughly the same as the amount of heat loss by the, res the respiratory water loss. So we can delete um, that term. And I also just knocked out the conduction term because um, uh, we can imagine an animal that's just sitting on, it, on its feet rather than on, on a last snake on its belly and get rid of a term. But then we just have solar and infrared radiation coming in and infrared being lost and convection being lost. And so here's, here's a breakout of those terms in, um, from, from just these words into some, uh, some actual formulae. And what we have here is the uh, amount of solar radiation coming uh, towards the organism multiplied by uh, the absorptivity of the animal to that solar radiation multiplied by the area of the animal. Um, and here we have a term for the infrared where you've got the flux of infrared coming in it's per meter squared, and that's being multiplied by the area of the animal. And what's being lost um, is also um, a function of area, surface area. So we have the surface area of the animal 
Um, and then this is a term that relates to the infrared heat loss that's proportional to the body temperature. It's in Kelvin, that's why 273 has been added onto the body temperature. So it's like body temperature in Celsius plus 273 to make it in Kelvin. Raise it to the power of four and multiply it by um, a couple of coefficients and you get the amount of heat lost from the surface. And then finally, there's the heat exchange by convection, um, which is proportional to the temperature difference between the animal's body and the air. The surface area again and this thing called the heat transfer coefficient so we've got the convection the infrared the radiation um, we can rearrange these terms so they're all on one side and the first law of thermodynamics says that they all should sum to zero make it a bit simpler um, we can take area out from all of these terms and put it um, to put some brackets around them all and multiply the whole thing through by area then we can actually um, combine, in fact, you can actually get rid of the area then because it's actually all on a per surface area basis. So that just makes the equation look even simpler by getting rid of the area. And then we can just lump the incoming radiation as one term. Um, get rid of the emissivity, um, which is a term that's near to one. Get rid of that, um, those, lump those two radiation terms together. So we have infrared and solar radiation coming to the organism as one term, and we end up with a, a simpler equation that's for the heat budget of the organism. And this complex term here, the heat transfer coefficient for convection, you can actually use for a lizard, this, this rough and ready equation, which is logic number 3.49 times the ratio of wind speed square rooted divided by the diameter of the animal square rooted. So um, embedded in this trait here, or this term here, we have the solar absorptivity of the organism. Um, embedded in this term here, we have the diameter. And, uh, and surface area is really in all of these terms as well. So we have these traits. Um, so we, we whack that, that term there in for, for the heat transfer coefficient, and we have a, a final equation. So there's our equation. It's giving, we have body temperature in degrees C, we have air temperature um, in degrees C, we have the radiation coming in in watts per meter squared, wind speed in meters per second and diameter in meters. Um, these equations, the units have to all, the dimensions have to all make sense. So um, it all has to result in, uh, in, in watts because we're talking about the flux of energy going, going in and out of the organism here. Okay, now, what we ideally want is the body temperature. What we're after is the body temperature as a function of the air temperature, the radiation, um, the body size, the wind speed, and the other traits. But the body temperature is stuck in this term here to the power of four and, and in this term here. We can't actually rearrange this equation. So we have body temperature equals and then everything else. Um, so you have to actually work out, we know the whole thing has to sum to zero. So what you can do is knowing um, all the terms except for the body temperature you iteratively guess body temperatures until the whole thing becomes zero it's a, a technique called um, root finding or um, shooting method so that's how you solve that equation and you can do that on a computer quite efficiently and the first time this was ever really done for an organism was for an american uh, lizard called the desert iguana a lizard that you get uh, in um, southwestern USA on the Baja Peninsula and around Arizona and California. It's a burrowing animal, eats leaves, it's about 40 centimetres long and it can survive a range of body temperatures between about 3 and 45 degrees. So what we can do is plug in the numbers, the traits relevant to these equations for the desert iguana and we can actually predict its body temperature if we know the um, environmental conditions. So it has a diameter of about 1.5 centimetres, 0.015 metres. Um, and if the wind speed was 20 to, uh, 2 metres per second and the air temperature was 20 degrees and it's receiving 700 watts per metre squared of radiation, then we can plug those numbers in here and find what body temperature would balance that equation. So, you know, it's going to be more than 20 degrees, but how much more? So here's the equation, put 700 watts here, um, put uh, 20 degrees here, 
the air temperature, the wind speed is two meters per second. There's the diameter. Um, what body temperature balances that? The answer is 26 degrees. And so we've solved for the body temperature of the animal. Now you can um, ask, all right, well, what combination of um, those environmental conditions would allow a survivable body temperature? So here we have radiation plotted against air temperature. We can say, we know this thing can survive between three and 45 degrees. So if we plug in three degrees and plug in 45 degrees into this equation, we can work out what combinations of radiation and air temperature this kind of organism could tolerate, knowing its traits of absorptivity um, to solar radiation, its diameter. Um, and just say we're considering a low wind speed environment to start with. So if we plug in um, three degrees, first of all, into this equation for the air temperature and um, for the surface temperature of the animal, sorry, for the body temperature, I should say, three degrees, then we get a straight line showing that this organism could tolerate, could be at a body temperature of three degrees across these combinations of radiation and air temperature which might look a bit weird when initially it says at 40 degrees C air temperature and zero radiation, the animal would be at three degrees. The reason that sounds weird is because you might be thinking about solar radiation, radiation only, but this is infrared and solar and there's always radiation around. So this is actually uh, not an existing environment, but if you were able to create one, uh, you'd have to raise the air temperature to 40 degrees to, to uh, make the animal um, three degrees or warmer. Similarly, at 600 watts of, of radiation, the animal could be three degrees at a temperature of minus 30, according to this equation. If we plug in the lethal maximum temperature of 45 degrees at the other end, we get um, the combination of air temperature and radiation that allows it to be 45. And you can see that if we had a thousand watts shining on the organism, um, the animal would only be able to tolerate negative 10. As I mentioned, there are some physically impossible conditions here, so we can just bound those, the clear night sky conditions and the clear sunny sky conditions. And this zone in here is the space of real climate um, conditions or environmental conditions that exist that are also within the body temperature range that it can survive. This is something that was called climate space by David Gates and also Warren Porter, um, the founders of this uh, field of biophysical ecology. And we can take that um, space, this is all for a wind speed of 0.1 meters per second, and now we can expand it to a range of different wind speeds. Um, and we, well, we can change the wind speed, see how the climate space changes. So if you, if you make it windier, then you get these lines being more parallel. Um, they become less dependent on radiation because the wind speed's higher. And you can do that through uh, multiple wind speeds, and we end up with a three-dimensional space that's describing the survivable conditions that this uh, for this particular lizard. So what you can see that we've done here is we've built uh, a depiction, a multivariate depiction of the survivable conditions in terms of just lethal extremes of temperature. Um, and it's been done on the basis of microclimatic conditions right, with a mechanistic model of heat exchange as our model. Um, and in the kinds of models that you've been working with mostly, you're doing something different where you're taking macroclimatic variables and using the occurrence points to define the environmental space. So in both cases, um, we're able, if we can actually work out what the microclimatic conditions are and get the traits of the organism, we can potentially then map that environmental space onto a real landscape to make inferences about, uh, inferences about distributions in the same way that we can, we can do that through a correlative model, um, as you well know by now. So we have the theory in from biophysical ecology of uh, what um, we need to know to solve this heat budget. And it tells us, obviously we need to know some traits of the organism uh, in terms of the actual thermal condition or the body temperatures that will kill the organism. So we need some physiological traits. Um, but the theory says we also need to know things like the diameter of the animal, um, might need the surface area for some more complex functions. This very simple case that I showed you, we actually got away with not using area explicitly, but we needed the diameter of the animal. 
but we also needed to know the wind speed and the air temperature and the radiation, and we needed to know it as experienced by the organism. And so this is a really um, fundamental problem. We need to understand the microclimate, and that's the topic of um, this book, Environmental Biophysics. There's also a classic book by Geiger on microclimates. It's quite a lot of uh, good literature on microclimates. As I mentioned right at the start, a very, very old topic, but um, only recently have we started to try and connect uh, or to compute microclimates from gridded environmental data, and it is possible. Um, so I'm just going to briefly say a few things about microclimates and then uh, introduce you to some models that um, you can play with that do both the microclimatic calculations and also um, calculations of heat budgets and activity budgets. So here's our desert scene again in Kalgoorlie, and here's a caricature of it in a cartoon. And I'm just going to go through the various microclimatic processes going on here that we need to think about and be explicit about to properly understand what the heat budget of an organism will be. And of course, one of the most fundamental driving factors is solar radiation. But solar, solar radiation comes in a variety of different uh, flavors and aspects. So we have direct radiation coming as a point source from the sun. But there's also diffuse radiation that's getting scattered by the atmosphere, making the sky blue, and also getting scattered by clouds. Um, how uh, much energy is absorbed by surfaces in the habitat will, of course, depend on uh, slope and aspect, which we can generate from uh, digital elevation models very easily these days in GIS packages. So one can actually um, compute how much solar radiation should be hitting a particular point uh, on the surface of the Earth, given the time of the year and the time of the day. Um, and we can also adjust for slope and aspect. So all those equations are well known and can be coded. And we can get the environmental data to drive that. Um, and habitat wise, we also need to know what the um, absorptivity is of the substrate, what the albedo is, so we know how much is actually absorbed. Um, but it's also how much is being absorbed is, of course, being affected by shade both by vegetation and by surrounding hills. I mentioned uh, infrared radiation or long wave radiation as this ubiquitous thing that we don't tend to think about, but um, there's always radiation coming down from the sky um, and it's also being lost from the surface. Of course, that's a big part of our uh, heat budget of the planet and, and the reason the planet's heating up is because um, not so much heat is, is being radiated back out into space, but is coming back down to Earth from the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So all the gases in the atmosphere are radiating uh, infrared radiation downwards, but on a clear night, there's very, very little. Um, if you go under the shade of a bush on a clear night, it will actually be warmer because the radiation is proportional to the effective temperature of the sky. And uh, the effective temperature of the sky when you're under a bush is the temperature of the leaves. So this is the reason why you don't see frost uh, so often underneath a tree, but you might see it out where it's been exposed to the cold night sky. And, and so there's radiation leaving the, leaving the, um, the surfaces proportional to their temperature. Um, and depending on that balance, uh, you may or may not get frost. And, and there's a special term that's a bit like the absorptivity or the albedo called the emissivity. Um, which dictates also how to what extent heat's being lost from the surface of a of um, from a surface, and in most cases the emissivity is pretty much near to one, but uh, there are some some environments where the emissivity is is quite low. Um, so you do need to know about that. In everyday experience, um, you might use aluminium foil in your cooking that has an an emissivity of virtually zero, and so what that does is cut any heat loss uh, from the surface. So when you wrap up your chicken or your potatoes after you take them out of the oven or your meat and you're letting it rest by putting, in, putting it in aluminium foil, what you're actually doing is cutting out a huge pathway of heat exchange um, that is increasing with the fourth power of the surface temperature. So um, very, very qu quick loss of heat through infrared radiation loss. If you cut that out by putting uh, aluminium foil around it, um, you really slow the cooling process down. It's just cooling by conduction to the bench and convection um, air, according to the air temperature. And if you hold your hand above your roast chicken wrapped up in foil, you won't feel the radiant heat coming off it. Cut out. 
So that's a really massive part of the heat budget. We don't think about it much, but it's part of microclimates and really important. Um, then we have the, the wind speed. So air is moving across the landscape and the speed of the, the wind is decreasing to zero by the time you get to the very um, surface of the ground. But exactly how that changes with height above the ground will vary depending on the um, roughness of the terrain, the spacing of bushes and that sort of thing. And the air temperature is also changing quite strongly with height above the ground. During the day, on this sunny day out in the desert, the air temperature near the ground is going to be much, much higher than it is at the height of the um, tips of these leaves up here. Um, but equally at night time, the situation reverses and you're going to end up with much, much older ground than you have um, air around where these leaves are. So um, the the change of air temperature with height above the ground is a really fundamentally important aspect of microclimate. And you'll see organisms exploiting this on hot days by climbing higher, getting into a higher wind speed and also getting into a lower air temperature. The other option, of course, when it gets uh, a bit um, harsh on the surface is to go underground. So there's, we, we really want to understand how temperature changes below the ground. And that's a very uh, complex process that's a function of the soil thermal properties. Um, and uh, the, the fluctuations in temperature as you go deeper and deeper into the ground become damped to the point where after about, um, well, down to about two metres, you're getting no fluctuations through a day or through or even through a, um, the, through a year. Um, but as you go shallower and shallower, once you go to about uh, 60 centimetres or so, you're getting fluctuations uh, through, uh, seasonally, but not through a day. And as you go less than 60 centimetres in general, you're starting to get diurnal fluctuations. But that whole process is really important in terms of a buffer. Some organisms are able to get underground and escape really extreme heat just by going underground. Um, and then also related to the, the soil um, heat budget is evaporation and soil moisture. So there's water being evaporated from the surface, also being evaporated from the trees whose roots are in the ground and rains falling down on the surface of the ground and percolating in. So um, this is really important, understanding the moisture content of the soil um, from the point of view of understanding the temperature of the soil, because the water actually affects the temperature and the degree of fluctuation. But many organisms have their um, bodies in the soil, roots if they're a plant, eggs if they're, you know, some lizards, um, frogs, close contact with the soil. And so the soil moisture is absolutely fundamental as a microclimatic driver. So we really want to be able to predict all of these things accurately enough to model species. And we can do that with exactly the same kinds of uh, equations that we were briefly looking at for solving a heat budget for a lizard. We simply solve a heat budget for the microclimate. Um, using all the same kinds of terms. And the, the good thing is that people have worked all this out um, in the past. And uh, despite the fact that microclimates are super variable, as this infrared imagery shows, um, what you can see here is a scene out in central Australia, a spinifex grassland. This area has been burnt, this area hasn't. And this is a scene with an infrared camera, ranging in temperature from in the mid 50s on a particularly, not a particularly hot um, March day, uh, this is an autumn day, um, down to about 32 degrees in the deep shade of this um, spinifex bush. And here is a picture of a lizard, uh, lizard that I showed right at the beginning. It's just sh taking shelter under this bush here. Um, it's actually at about 44 degrees. And this lizard has a huge range of environmental conditions available to it on the surface, but also underground. Um, and you may think, well, there's no way we're going to be able to capture that in a realistic way to model a heat exchange. But in fact, you can. There are some uh, clever tricks that have been developed. Uh, and uh, it turns out we can make pretty accurate calculations of, of these conditions and um, characterize them in a way that allows us to capture the fact that this animal's environment is changing as it behaves. Um, so. Um, I'll mention um, a couple of times uh, a, a package, an R package that um, that I've developed standing on the shoulders of giants. I've basically taken um, programs developed by Professor Warren Porter from the University of Wisconsin, um, added some bells and whistles, but put them in the R environment so they're easy to use. And I'll, I'll point you to a website that has um, all the in, um, 
the background for those models and uh, instructions for how to install them and so on and so forth right at the end. But I've recently made some shiny apps that run the models so that even if you, uh, you know, you're not even an R coder or um, it, if, yeah, if you just want to have a play with these models and get a feel for them without having the overheads of uh, learning coding or learning the particular way to run these models, um, these shiny apps exist and I've put the websites for, for them down the bottom here. There's one um, which I'm showing you the screen for, which is, um, I've called it a global soil microclimate calculator. It's basically running a microclimate model. Um, and uh, it has, uh, the main plot here is the soil temperature at different depths. So um, you can choose which depths you're seeing. Uh, it's happening to start off at uh, Uluru, which is that big rock in the middle of Australia. Um, and this is showing in January the, the way that the surface temperature would change in red. This is going up to about 50 degrees uh, and then going progressively deeper into the soil. You can see the damping fluctuations as you go deeper and deeper. Um, and you can also see the, the timing of the maximum changing as you go deeper and deeper. Um, but you can go anywhere you want in the world with this and it will calculate the conditions not only for the soil temperature but the air temperature, wind speed, humidity and solar radiation level. Um, and what you're seeing, I know this is a small figure here, but it's showing you the air temperature uh, with the dashed blue line as you would get from gridded environmental data, but the black line is the adjustment for a certain height above the ground relevant to an organism that you specify. And in this case, it's one centimetre above the ground. Same with the wind speed. So the air temperature is much higher um, during the day at one centimetre than at two metres, as I was saying before. And the wind speed is um, much higher at, uh, from the gridded data. This is at about, about 1.2 metres or two metres compared to one centimetre where it's much lower. And there are checkboxes to expand on um, allowing you to look to change various parameters of the model, like the slope and the aspect the angle of the horizon, you can uh, change this, you miss it, the albedo of the substrate and so on and so forth and play around with this and plot different months um, and different places. So that's the soil app. Uh, then there's an app that is running that, that microclimate model, but then on top of that running a model that solves the heat budget of an animal that you specify. And that's showing um, uh, as the plots um, a plot of the body temperature as a function of hour of the day um, for the animal um, in question. So by default, it's a default, it's a dragon lizard from Australia at Uluru. And so you can see the body temperature of the animal as it's thermoregulating. And these lines on the, on the graph are the various thermal thresholds, the critical limits and the behavioral limits that you specify for the animal. And these plots on the right show you how much shade the animal needs to seek through a day. So you can see, um, in this particular plot, the animal is, uh, it, this is showing for um, January that by about um, eight in the morning, this animal is needing to seek some shade to keep cool. And by about midday, it actually has to hide underground. So you can see this bottom plot here is the depth that the animal's at, starting off underground, then coming out and being active on the surface, but then going and hiding under the ground to avoid the heat in the middle of the day, coming out and foraging in the afternoon. And then this plot here, shows the activity window. Uh, we were just looking at January, so it's got the different months of the year and the different hours of the day. And in January, it's got in black when it's nighttime and the animal's hiding, in blue when it's bas light blue when it's, sorry, that's dark blue when it's underground uh, because it's night, in um, light blue when it's basking, in gold when it's foraging, and then white where it's uh, unable to be active and hiding underground. And so that's January and you can see as you go through the different months of the year, activity constricting into the cooler months in the Southern Hemisphere, um, June and, and July, and then expanding again into the, into the spring. And you can expand, uh, there's a checkbox to expand out and get all the traits that are driving this model. You can make it nocturnal or diurnal or crepuscular, change all those different thresholds and, and play around with it. And again, go anywhere you like in the world. And um, that's, both of those apps are using a long-term monthly average climatology. It's really quick to calculate, um, easy to play with um, and make quick calculations. Um, but there's also an app that takes a little bit longer to run, not too much longer, 
that is running off daily gridded data that's historical. It's the NCEP data set, and it goes from 1949 up till last month. And this is pretty much exactly the same thing as I just showed you before, uh, starting off in Namibia just to be different, and uh, but basically you can do exactly the same thing. So there's some toys to play with to get a bit more of a feeling of what I was talking about in terms of um, heat budgets uh, and uh, microclimates.